Well, I moved out here when I was four years old to archery, and this is where my life was formed. It's where I um, grew up. It's where I learned all my uh, basic moral values. Uh, we didn't have any uh, close white neighbors. All our neighbors were African Americans. And my mother uh, nursed a lot. And on duty then, it was 20 hours a day, so she was gone a good bit. <clears throat> so um, I lived uh, immersed in the society of black Americans, my playmates. Uh, with whom I fought and wrestled and played and worked and fished and hunted <clears throat> were all uh, African-American kids. And um, in this house where we're sitting now lived Rachel and Jack Clark. So when my mother and daddy were gone off, I, I stayed here in this house. I slept on a pallet over there on the floor that was just uh, stuffed with corn shucks. And in the wintertime, Rachel would let me move my pallet over close to the fire to stay warm. Um, most of the things I learned about the uh, God's world were learned from Rachel Clark. And most of the things I learned about farm work were learned from my husband, Jack. <clears throat> he was the one that was in charge of, uh, of the farm. Uh, the heart of archery then, which was a good bit further west, was the Seaboard Airline Railroad maintenance crew headed by Mr. Watson. And he always had six uh, very able men who worked with him. And they went up and down the railroad almost 15 miles in both directions. And they repaired the cross ties and make sure that the rails were straight and make sure that the many trains that went along the tracks every day uh, could do so safely. And uh, that was kind of the elite uh, job in archery was to get a job with the, with the railroad. Uh, they furnished a house, they, they had a, even a retirement system which was almost unknown then. And um, they live um, in Seaboard Airline Railroad houses. But archery was a very close-knit uh, community. And um, the most uh, prestigious citizen, and we thought the richest citizen, uh, was Bishop William Decker Johnson whose home was in archery, <clears throat> but who served, I think, five uh, Midwestern states, all the AME churches, the African Methodist, Episcopal churches in those five states, he served all them. But he would come home on occasion, <clears throat> and he had a little college in archery. They had some boarding students, and, uh, and in a few of the black children, once they finished high school, uh, would go to the college as well. But Bishop Johnson was kind of the uh, most uh, influential and famous and rich and prestigious person who lived in the, in the entire community. It's very probable that the African Americans who established the archery community, who lived in this area, were descendants of the slaves who had been on the plantations in this area. Some of them could have been Chapel Cox's slaves. There was one young man who did take the Cox name and lived in Sumter County later on. Another example would have been the Raven family who lived out here for a good while associated with St. Mark's Church. There was a Dr. Raven who was a slave owner in this area. So it's very possible that the blacks who established archery, who lived here, who bought lots here, were descendants of the slaves who had been brought here uh, as slaves to work on the plantations in this area. My great-grandfather, Will Raven, was a slave, and he was, according to the research, was also part of that community. He, he became a, a, a minister and moved away from that community earlier in the uh, uh, early, late 1800s, early 1900s. And if we, as we recall, he went to Savannah as a, as a minister. He also became one of the uh, trustees of Morris Brown College uh, early when it's, it was founded, along with Bishop Johnson. And my, Grandfather, who was Levi Raven, was one of the founders of 
of the Johnson Home Industrial College along with Bishop Johnson and other founders. Bishop William Decker Johnson was one of the most prominent uh, figures in not only Sumter County but our certainly our neighbor to the west, Webster County. Uh, originally born in Thomasville, he was raised in uh, southwest Georgia, served as a minister of the AME Church uh, in a number of localities, but in 1912 came back here after a, a brief sojourn in Columbus, Georgia, and uh, organized in, uh, in that year the community of archery, had it incorporated, uh, hired a surveying crew of uh, Crook and Lanou to um, draw a plat map and, and form the town of archery. Uh, at that point, deeds were sold off in a barbecue and, uh, and residents bought property all through the new town. You used to hear my mama say that they had a society in there to call it Sublime Order of Archery. I can't remember yet. I guess that was for my day, and um, I guess that's why they named it Archery, I guess, I don't know. The Sublime Order of Archery was a help organization that provided resources for farm members and other members that were members of the organization for any need that they needed met. Um, basically, it grew from what I could gather after the Johnsons came into the Archer community and it went from just in that local area to three other border states. Um, this is where I understand the college really started to, to flourish. They had um, boys and girls dormitories and they, uh, they were actually uh, students from all over the United States. The school made the difference that made me, and the train stopping here made the other difference. And there were, maybe I could say at one time that train, they would stop here and they would shh. This school had a, had where, where you could work on the farm, and you work and go to school, and they had watermelons and stuff they could ship from here, and that train used to stop right up there, and they had a spur, I called it, sidetrack that went along here, and they shipped, they loaded it from right here in this community and shipped it from all over. Well, when Bishop Johnson was home, uh, he always preached one or two Sundays uh, at St. Mark. <clears throat> he was not the regular pastor. And when he preached, they would invite a choir down from Atlanta, uh, representing one of the colleges up there, to sing in St. Mark. <clears throat> and he would always invite my father to bring our family to the preaching service. And it was a very uh, unforgettable experience for us, not only because of the beautiful music uh, that a choir from, from Atlanta would, uh, would sing, a college choir, but also Bishop Johnson's preaching. He had an ability to, uh, <clears throat> to preach like a, a Shakespearean scholar when he wanted to, using the fanciest and, and most highfalutin words, but when he wanted to really make a point, he could also preached just like he was one of those section foreman workers. You know, uh, work just come out of a cotton field. He could preach down to earth and use the uh, slang language that was uh, used in the woods and fields around here. And, and I, one thing I remember about the uh, services was, was after uh, Bishop Johnson had preached a while <clears throat> and got the congregation all warmed up, uh, he would stop and uh, that was when they would take up collection. and. Uh, they would let everybody uh, walk by the table in front and the deacons or stewards, whatever the <clears throat> methods call them, would be sitting there and, and when somebody would put uh, a, a donation on the table, they would call out how much it was. Like uh, Brother Sly gave 25 cents, folks, bought, and my daddy always gave like a dollar, which was a lot of money then. <clears throat> that was a day's wages. And uh, folks would just really applaud for my, for Mr. Earl Carter, who gave that contribution. And then after they, everybody went by, <clears throat> one row at a time just marched by, 
and you had to give something or be embarrassed. <laughs> and then uh, everybody would sit back down and then uh, they might sing a couple more hymns and then uh, Bishop Johnson would preach some more. But I saw in him, uh, being just a little boy, <clears throat> the uh, ultimate in achievement because he not only kept his roots deep in archery, but he also uh, was a man who had worldwide uh, success. I think one of the photographs that I have of him is at the base of the Eiffel Tower. <clears throat> I know he did go to Paris, for instance, to uh, some kind of Methodist conference, but, but I looked on him as, as kind of an idol of a, or an example of someone uh, who could keep his roots deep where he was born and raised, but at the same time be successful in almost every aspect of life. In education, he had a little insurance company. Um, as a great uh, religious leader, uh, and with secular success. He always uh, rode in a, in a big black automobile, uh, either a Packard or a Cadillac, and he had a chauffeur. And so it was a, a big deal when Bishop Johnson would come home. Everybody in this side of the county would know about it. As a full state, I was baptized by Bishop Johnson, one who, as a child, and there all of the Christmas times each year, what he did when he came back home, he would always include every child in the community. So we had a Christmas tree here at Christmas time through the Sunday school. And from there we'd go down to the school here and have another Christmas tree, which he would involve all of the community's people then. Even a newborn babe would name would be called if he were told the name of the child. I can remember at one time when Bishop Johnson had this Christmas tree. All of the men got together and went out and found the biggest tree they could find, pull it down there and stand it up. And everybody in the community had a present, white or black, he had a present. And I thought that was mighty wonderful. A lot of people wouldn't have thought of it that way, but he did. Bishop Johnson made sure that there was a present for everyone in archery, both uh, adults and children. And in the uh, Johnson Home and Industrial College, uh, there was always a big Christmas tree, <clears throat> and on that Christmas tree was a present for everybody. And there was another Christmas tree in St. Mark's AME Church, uh, and some of the uh, children used to complain because uh, although there was a present for everyone, before they got a present, they had to, to uh, recite something, either a Bible verse or maybe two lines and a poem. And uh, some of the uh, children would complain because a few of the young people would show off by composing an original poem or by memorizing a long poem. <clears throat> just to make the other children feel kind of bad. But um, although the children believed in Santa Claus, um, just about everybody knew that the gifts came from Bishop Johnson. This is the last Christmas gift that I got off a of Christmas tree down at Bishop Johnson's uh, Christmas, the last Christmas tree that he gave, and uh, the year of 1935, because he he passed in 36, and the last Christmas tree he gave was in 35. And I have kept that ever since. Upon his death in June of 1936, uh, it was as testimony to his prominence in the uh, in the area. Uh, not only the 
local daily newspaper, the Times Recorder, but as it's a weekly competitor as well, the Tri-County News, both featured uh, obituaries of Bishop Johnson on the front page of their papers. And uh, having done extensive research on the, in the newspapers locally, I can tell you that uh, in uh, a period preceding that for about a hundred years, uh, it was almost impossible to find a, a person in the black community to be covered in such a way. And uh, this is definitely testimony to, uh, to the bishop's prominence. I remember when he was buried that uh, there was a cortege of, uh, in the funeral procession that, that, uh, that extended almost all the way from Archer Plains. Uh, the most big black Oldsmobiles and Cadillacs and Buicks and Packards that we ever saw. People came from all over the country really to pay homage to, uh, to this famous and good man. I remember the first teacher that I ever had was, her name was Annie Simmons from, I think her home was out in, in Alabama. There were two sisters of them and they were real good teachers. But they always had real good teachers there. And uh, the Johnson older cheer, and they went to school, and, and they come back home and taught school there, Fanny and, and uh, Reverend Debbie D. Johnson, the, the junior. Because he, he was my teacher when I was in the seventh grade. Okay, when I started the school, grammar school, I started in Johnson College building. And there, there wasn't a college at that time, it was the elementary school. And that's where I went from first to maybe the sixth grade. It burned down and then we moved up across the railroad track into the church and that's where I finished seventh grade at. But now the Johnson School, I remember it was a big two-story building. and. I don't remember how many teachers were there, but I do remember two, two teachers. There were more than two, but I do remember two, the two that I went to. And uh, the Johnson home was a big two-story building also, and it was near where the school was. It, they were close together. I can recall earlier when uh, my first school days were at the, uh, it was called the Johnson Home Industrial College, but it was just an elementary school when I started back in the early 30s. Um, because my very first day of school with my boots on, on the front seat, <laughs> that was an exciting time for me. I started early because at that time you could get in school. All my brothers, without being the youngest of my family, all, they had already started, and I was excited about getting in school. The school provided some very uh, rich and wholesome activities. Um, it was a very uh, unique school in that it had various classrooms, it had a, an auditorium for assembly programs, and uh, the most fascinating time that I can remember was during the closing of school when the community would just if it would be about five days, a whole week of closing, and all of the grades would have activities, and and the whole community would turn out for the closing activities, and it was just really a um, just a big affair, if I can, as I recall. My mom couldn't read and write, but after we got up pure and going to school, back and forth going to school. She took to making daily telegraph. And we had to read her that paper every, every day. And uh, when the Nimbug baby was kidnapped, we sure had to read her everything. Every day we had to read it was what what she she wanna know what they're saying about the Limburg baby that unfound him. I know they gonna find him dead. 
I want to know where they done found him. <laughs> and we had we had to read her that paper every day. And we had to read her often and in the gumps. Every day. And she'd say, what you think I sent you to school for? And right today, I like a fine paper sometimes. And I like to read. Everybody got out there. We got out in the field. And uh, there was a time when we didn't go to school all the way. At nine months, they went seven months. And after the seven months, then we went, went to work and in the field. But we mostly here, this was just a farming area, that's all. And it was farming from here all the way down, all the way back into the Bartford area on back and I remember all those. Work in the field. That was all kind of what you had to do, was work in the field. You go ahead, you're going to go to the field, Back in those days, they planted a lot of cotton, and you had to chop it. They, they called it chopping cotton, or hoeing cotton. I chopped the cotton. There the cotton be you no know, sold off, so you had to thin it out. Thin it out, you know, leave about two stalks to a, two stalks to a hill, you know, where we say hill. Leave two stalks there and go in where we chop out, you know, leave about two more stalks standing. That way we chopped it, had to chop in the car, we would be thinning it out. And Martin Cotton, when somebody here in the city, they wonder what it, what it consists of. But it's poisoning cotton for bow weevil. That's the way they had it then. You take molasses and you take that arson and put it together. And it was, you put your mop in there, you put it in a bucket and you put your mop. And then when you go and hit the leaves, that would stick to the leaves and then the bow weevil would take and that would kill the bow weevil. So that's what that means. That molasses would stick that to the leaves in the rain and wash it off so quick. And the bow weevil would, and that would give the opportunity for the bowl to mature for your cotton to make cotton. But when we was working out on the farm, after my father passed, we had to work by the day to make a living. And my mother would picking cotton. We would, if me and my brother couldn't get us a, a hundred pound of cotton, my mama gave us a whipping until she found out we couldn't pick that hundred pound of cotton. And my younger sister would beat us picking cotton. She'd tell us the one picked a hundred pound of cotton would get five cents. And when Friday come, my sister would have 25 cents, and me and my brother didn't have nothing unless she let us go to the field on Saturday morning and what us pick on Saturday morning, she'd give it to us so we could have us some money. But we couldn't, we couldn't get that 100 pound of car. I remember I was a... 14 or 15 years old before ever I picked a hundred pound of cotton. And we hold peanuts, pick cotton, shook peanuts. So we did hold, had to hold every roll of peanuts. You hold the grass out. But when we weren't chopping up the peanuts, we just hold it, getting the grass out the peanuts. And uh, I picked cotton. Shake peanuts and put them on stacks. They were plying the peanuts up and then we had to go and shake them. And, they were in, and we would put them on a stack, stack them up on a stack.
and all that. You think about the farm, it was work, cause, you know, you had to try to keep the grass out of it, didn't you? You know, they wouldn't make the grass, or just take it, it wouldn't make uh, anything. You got paid by the weight. How many pounds of cotton you had? I mean, yeah, how many pounds of cotton you had? But when you're working by the day, you got paid by the day, like hoeing or pulling corn or something like that. And um, let's see, shaking, shaking peanuts. You you ship them by the day. And then later on, you got where they paid you by the stack. You ship peanuts by the stack. If you made, if you ship so many stacks, keep it with your stacks all day. You got paid by that stack. But that's the way we, people had to make their living. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Walk a little bit down them rows, every row, <laughs> with a hole. And we just got 50 cents a day. But we thought that was a lot of money. I think they went from 50 and finally I think they went up to a dollar a day, I believe. You had your garden at home, in, at, your, at your house. You had a place for a garden. You had your chicken. You didn't buy no chickens. You raised your chicken and most of the time you raised your, your hogs hog at home. And you had your cow, and you milked your cow, you had your milk and butter, you didn't buy none. Back those days. During the year after the corn get up, when you plow, you could put peas in, the, in between where the corn, and they would grow up and make peas in there, or you could put varroa beans in there, and the varroa bean would grow up, and that would be a the varroa bean was served as a food for the uh, stock at, during the winter months. And that, but it, it would mean when they drive, they had a foreign and it would sting you like a, like a bee or something. <laughs> and it would eat you up. So we had to pick those things. They had peas, you could pick the peas. And then they, when they get dry, they would pick them. They had a machine, they could uh, shell all those peas and bag them up and they'd be dry peas and you could, you could have peas for the winter when you need peas. Uh, they would, you could, I don't know where you ever noticed at the store they have some peas that's dried and butter being dry, so they, they had those peas there and you could, that would be food for us for the winter. We could go there and get those peas and boil them, get some ham hock and put in there and they had good meat. Yeah. Now Mr. Joy Simpson, he was uh, one of us Sunday school superintendent, he lived right around the curve where the church is at there. He had his own cane meal, he made syrup. We all had fun to go down there and drink some of the cane skimming with him. <laughs> Until Dan got in it and got high, <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> Dan was his mule. <laughs> well, an average day on the farm was the same as it was all over South Georgia. Uh, an hour before daylight. <clears throat> Uh, Jack Clark would get up in this house and, and walk right outside and ring a big bell that you could hear all over the farm. And we'd get up in the dark and put on our clothes and go down to the barn. And everybody would catch the mules for that day that Jack Clark assigned to the different workmen. And uh, then we would uh, get the wagon and plows and uh, out of the shed on the palm. And we'd go to the field where we were going to work that day, which my daddy had decided. And we would stand at the um, end of the rows until it got light enough to make sure we knew where the cotton and peanuts and corn plants were so we wouldn't plow them up when the mule started pulling the plow. 
And we would work until dinner time, which is when, which would be a noon sun time, when the sun got highest. Then we would stop working for an hour or so, and then we'd go back to work after dinner and work till sundown. And then we'd come back here to the barn and, and rub down the mules and take good care, make sure they were fed good, pump water so they had plenty of water to drink. And then come home and eat supper and go to bed. Usually by the time it got dark, uh, we would try to be in the bed because it was it cost a good bit to in this house to keep a kerosene lamp burning, and so and everybody was tired by then, so we'd go to bed. Uh, when it was good dark. When I was a teenager, my mother and daddy would let me uh, <clears throat> stay up. So I would lie down in front of the fireplace until eight o'clock. And i uh, wake up then. When the clock struck eight, I'd wake up and turn on the radio for 15 minutes and hear Glenn Miller, who was my favorite orchestra leader. And so when Glenn Miller was over at 8.15, I would go to bed. But in the meantime, everybody else in my family had already been asleep for an hour or two. And the next morning, it was the same thing again. We came to Autry in 1926, and Daddy had a job on the Seaboard Railroad. And it was, I was three years old, and it was right funny about us moving there. Um, they carried our furniture up and down the railroad for about two weeks, and we had to cook in the fireplace. Of course, I was three years old. It, I enjoyed it. It was fun to me, but Mama didn't like very much cooking in the fireplace. So finally, after two weeks, they, they um, brought our furniture, and um, we lived there till oh, about... 25, 30 years. When I started the railroad, I Mr. Joe Hill, Mr. Watson was the foreman. I started off under him. 1948, Mr. Joe Hill and Mr. C. Whitfield, Mr. Eddie Pry and Willie Wilson. They were the one out there when I went there. They were the one who taught me how to railroad. They all are gone now. And I didn't realize that until a few months ago. And someone told me that you're the only one from Archer that works on the railroad living out there now. I said, oh, no. And I got to look around and show them if it was. Other than Miss Ruby Watson and them now, they was, they were living here with the dead when I started the railroad out there. But the rest of those people are dead and gone. And I thank the Lord I'm still able to be here and have care on the church right now. Well, when I started out here, I started off with a brass I cut no clean up like they got through you know? Cause now that's what later, they got a bigger job to do that now. We used to have to do it with a bush axe in hand. And uh, my first day was, oh, about a, might have been close to a mile up there where I started at, but the second house is sit right here. And uh, went from that to clean up right away and then when come time to put in cross tie, we had to take our shelf and cut all this back. You shouldn't have that rock in, you got the shell in there. Now they helped keep that grass down. You'd have the grass with a shell. The crawling would be the, well, say, say, say for instance, five or six of a line up, and three over here and three over there. And then the caller, most of stand out there, and he'd call it. They line up, boys, and line up right. I don't got that much other ready. But anyway, I would wrap the bar three times and then pull. Three times. And then pull. And each time you can see that track move. And so that's where we line the track. Hard work. Hard work. Always has been. But they got it easy now. They got a machine to set that move it either way you want to. I watched people work on the railroad by living right here inside it for a long time. Seen the train running down here, passing the train once running this same road. 
And I think the last one I can remember, a passenger train running here in 1951. Run from Savannah to Montgomery and turn around and go back. And down y'all at the church where we were Sunday, you just walk out there and flag him down. He'd stop and pick you up. And coming back, he'd put you off at the same place. I chanced to one time to get a pass from uh, Arthur to Savannah, Savannah to Jacksonville, and come back the same way. My two kids were small. First pass I ever got, we went to Jacksonville and come back. The railroad was very important because that was our transportation. <laughs> Other than walking, we would get on the train, I don't, maybe 10 or 15, maybe 25 cents, I don't remember what it was. But we would catch dummy out at Archer and ride the planes and we get off at the depot. And we thought we was in New York. <laughs> Plane was a city then for us. And we just enjoyed coming down, being with the kids in downtown. And uh, then we catch it going back in the afternoon. And we would even catch it sometime and come out here to church. This was Lebanon Church out here. And uh, we wanted to come down here to something special on Sundays. We would catch the train and maybe we'd have to walk back if they wouldn't be through when the train went back. Or maybe we were dating, we wanted to walk with the boys and girls. <laughs> and we would walk back to Archer. But we had to be home before the sun went down. <laughs> Definitely we had to be home before sundown. The second high was built all in the one room. Your kitchen, your bedroom, and everything in the same room. And then, uh, I, would, I would just guess at about 50 feet apart. Just far enough to keep from disturbing one another. And uh, they was they were lined up down the side of the road here. And the foreman house, now it had, uh, if I make no mistake, I believe it had four or five rooms on the back porch to it. It was bigger than any of the rest of the houses. So uh, it left. They, I think they sold them houses because different one bought them. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I remember about them is that was the best job anybody knew about <clears throat> because it was a permanent job. They got paid every day, whether it rained or not. Uh, they had a retirement program. They had a house in which to live. And I think almost all of them went to St. Mark AME Church. And they were kind of the heart of the choir because all day long on the railroad, uh, they also would... Uh, would either sing or, or hum and keep time. And as they drove in the spikes with their special big hammers, uh, it was always in rhythm. So they had a natural way, not only to sing on Sundays in church, but to practice all the week you know, while they were at work. They were, I would say, real friends and friends to daddy. When my father passed away, they. They came in the house to see him, and they cried. Said that was the best friend they ever had. He was gone. I remember they, there was two old churches. They were little small churches. Uh, I remember the the, the first time. Uh, the first one I remember there, he was sitting right where when that train come along, if the preacher was in the pulpit, he could see the train stopped. You could, he, he'd look right in, the, the conductor would, could look right in the church door. All right, now the church, I understand, was right in this area right here. And like I said, they were moved in 1927. I was born in 1926, but I wasn't big enough to know too much about it, but the more what I was told. And you can only talk about that, you know. <laughs> but my dad and John put us all in the church early age, something like five or six months old. And a lot of us stayed there until we got married and decided to leave home. I hadn't left yet. I went off and work, but I come back on meeting Sundays. As the boy just came a storm and blew the church down uh, at one time, 
and left the pulpit standing there in in that area. There might be some pictures to that effect. I don't know what, where they're taking it, but all the other part of the church and the pulpit area there was still standing with just a little wave there, all that part stayed there. And I I remember the time when it was a household that the preacher lived in and called the parsonage. Uh, our church it was the focal point of the you know, that's St. Mark Me Church. That's where everybody went for their religious activities. Um, it was a it was a early on I can recall there was something every day or every night in the week. Uh, maybe Saturday night. Sometimes Saturday there'd be a little uh, fish fry in, in in the community where someone would, would go and enjoy. Um, but the the church was open for uh, class meetings. Even the, there was an evening when the Sunday school uh, superintendent and the teachers would meet instead of the lesson and have it prepared for the Sunday. We had prayer here at this church. They would come here and have prayer. And one of the things that uh, Bishop Johnson's wife would say to us, everybody had to pray. And in the midst of you having that, if you didn't, say a prayer, she would, on the end, include everybody and they had to go into unison and have a prayer in unison. Everybody had to pray before it was over with. So prayer stood out quite a bit in my life. Even now, I still tell the my people that we have to pray continuously. It's a kinfolk deal out here. Everybody out here kin to one another. <laughs> That's why our church get along as well as it do. We had some fine Sunday school teachers out here. My dad taught Sunday school out here for a while when I was a boy. And Mr. George Simpson, he was Sunday school superintendent. And, uh, the ones be a different class. We still, we still have Sunday school every Sunday right on. Our regular service is on uh, second and fourth Sunday. Sunday school at 10 o'clock. Try to have the preacher in the pulpit at 11 o'clock. That way you're out by one, one thirty the more. Don't hold nobody too long. And I think we all enjoy it. <laughs> well, this used to be a community. They didn't they didn't play ball on Sunday. Uh, then, but finally they got where they would play on Saturdays, but they didn't play on Sunday. You had to be at church here on Sunday or they had church uh, in the morning, Sunday school, and at noon they had service and they had to come back in the afternoon. The road would be full of people in the afternoon coming back to church from both ends. I would have people living on both ends and then we get here and just, they just had a hallelujah time here. Well, the Autry was a close-knitted, caring community where Christianity played a vital role in, in the uh, community uh, overall success. Um, there wasn't any uh, wealth that 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 was one could take a lot of pride in. Everybody was pretty much on the same level. This was right after the depression that I grew up, in, and and there wasn't a lot of money that was made at that time, and and but there was no. Uh, starvation that that we can ever recall in in the community because everybody provided the garden and as I stated earlier they had their own meats and and nobody went hungry. Archery seemed just like a, a family. It was a community family. Everybody seemed to love and care for one another. If my dad had killed a hog, he would send a, a, a little batch to everybody in the community. And the next family, if they did that, they would share vegetables the same way. And when one had, everybody had. If you had milk, we had vegetables, and the other one had chickens or eggs or something like that. We just shared, they shared with one another. And everybody just loved everybody, black and white. I think the unity came that way, so we didn't, it didn't seem to be any total separation, although we didn't ever mix up in, in church and all that, but we did have community life together. And they could, those who did, uh, 
decided to come, they could come to church whenever they wanted to. President Carter, I know his dad and they, they did visit our church some and some of the others who wanted. So my mother and the Watson and all them, they was close. We could go down and and get something. If we needed something, we can go down to their house because we were right, right just a few steps from their house. And we go down there and get it something that we needed. If she was out of something they had, that she could get it from them. Autry was a, a unique community, and it, that it was people caring for people. It was um, about 25 um, families of Afro-American people and two families of white people, and. Um, they were people caring for people. Like, if my mother had a, was sewing and give out a thread or something, um, in five minutes there'd be five spools of thread there. So it was just like people caring for people there in Archery. And I think that Archery and the life uh, out here was typical of a disillusionment of me and others <clears throat> because although I, my life as a boy was, was completely integrated, there wasn't any distinction between me and, and my playmates. Uh, the, the, the society accepted and didn't question uh, gross discrimination. Not only did a black child not have a chance for a good education, but their parents couldn't uh, vote and couldn't serve on a jury and couldn't participate in the other facets of life. When I would get on the train <clears throat> a few times down at Archery to ride to Americas to go to the uh, theater with A.D. Davis, who was my best friend, who happened to be black, <clears throat> we would um, walk down the road together and get on the train. I would sit in the white section, he would sit in the colored section, and we'd ride to Americas together and get off at the depot in America, and we walked down the street, maybe holding hands. We were close friends. We'd get to the theater, I'd go to the front, he'd go to the back, and I would sit down stairs in the nice seats, and he would go way up in the balcony and sit in little tiny cramped seats for colored people. And then after the movie was over, we'd get back together and come back home. That's the way it was. What did it make you feel kind of funny when you go out there and you don't see no houses, nobody around, and you know I was raised up out there and there were plenty of people in plenty of houses and everybody, somebody was in, in, in all those houses. But all that's past and gone now. And when you get out of the church and you see the folks, you'll you be all right. Because there's plenty of them be out there. <laughs> Or that younger generation. And I guess maybe that's I guess maybe that's that's why we go out there, <laughs> cause people that has gone away, our family when they come, they want to go out there for homecoming and what have you. Once a year they have homecoming out at the church, and we go out there. I don't know. They they still go to church to the, at that church, and they built the church up till it's nice looking now. And like I said, if they see us in town anywhere, they want to stop 
and go through all those stories of what we did when we were playing together. And it was just a, a bunch of people that were just knitted together and still is, those that are still living. Some of them, well, all of them were raised up out there, coming to church out there. The old head that was still living, they, them that moved off, they coming to church. It was that, that was their church. And they brought the younger ones out there, and just like right now, those younger children coming on out there. The church. And that younger generation is they. <laughs> have some children, they bring them on out there to church. And if they stay around in a Plains of America's one. They gonna come out there to church. It's just in the jeans, I guess. I wanna go home. It is our hope and dream that someday that the um, history that that has gone on and, and it's still going on in many instances in our community can be preserved. There are only about three or four or maybe less than a dozen houses, a uh, half dozen houses that's lit in that area right now that that, that was um, in existence back in the early 30s. Um, hopefully we can renovate or repair those houses back to, or restore those houses back to a uh, uh, setting that, that would be similar to what it was in the, in the 30s. Uh, hopefully we could establish some type of a museum that could um, really be a, a, a resource that everyone could hear and understand what went on in the Archer community. Archer will survive in the future at least as it is now, <clears throat> because uh, my boyhood home and this house has, has now been preserved, I hope forever, and will be cared for by the U.S. Park Service. And uh, thousands of people will come here from all over the world, literally every year, to see how people lived uh, in those days uh, at our tree. And it's the only place in America uh, where a school child or a teacher or family on vacation can go and, uh, and learn how people did live during the Depression years on a farm. <clears throat> the other thing that will make archery preserved, I think, is a historical commemoration of the life of, of Bishop Johnson, which is located right in the heart of archery, where the Seaboard section foreman used to live. And uh, I, I presume that 200 years from now that mark will still be there and folks will still read about Bishop Johnson and uh, what he meant to his fellow citizens, what he meant to people that observed his life. Well, my, my thinking is the prayers of the righteous prevail as much. So is the prayer of our mother and father still live here that bring us back in this community and it keeps this community moving. And I often tell them now, nah, we need to pray so our children will have something to hang on to. I believe it always be an archery. It's come this far. I can see that. that it's come this far.
Everybody stand and sing. Ah. 